up on this Wednesday edition of Daybreak. The Korean government logs its largest tax revenue shortfall on record last year on the back of lower corporate tax and VAT earnings. Prime Minister nominee Lee Wang Gu comes under fire over alleged influence peddling over the media and a number of other ethical lapses on the first day of his confirmation hearing. First, the White House confirms the death of Kayla Muller, an American aid worker who had been held hostage by Islamic State militants in Syria. Daybreak begins now. Hello and thanks for joining us to our viewers around the world. It's 6 a.m. on Wednesday, February 11th here in Seoul. I'm Mark Broom and you're tuned in to Daybreak. Our top story this morning, as the debate rages over whether to fund welfare programmes without raising taxes, the Finance Ministry reported Tuesday that the government saw a record tax revenue shortfall of some 10 billion US dollars last year. 2014 marked the third straight year, in fact, that the government has missed its tax revenue target. Uh, Hwang Jie starts us off. Korea's tax revenue came in at around 205 trillion won, or roughly 190 billion U.S. dollars, last year. That is 10 billion dollars shy of the government's goal. Last year's shortfall was the largest on record breaching that posted at the height of the Asian financial crisis in 1998. The finance ministry largely attributes the shortfall to sluggish corporate tax revenue stemming from companies' weak performances. It also says slumping domestic demand and a strengthening Korean won against the greenback prompted a fall in value-added taxes and customs duties. For next year, the government is aiming to collect tax revenue that's up around 2% from last year's target. It's confident about the goal, saying it will push through structural reforms and economic revitalization plans this year. But experts are skeptical about it. The pace of recovery in China and in European countries is likely to fall below expectations this year, and the economy at home is not showing signs of a strong recovery either. Given that Korea's tax revenue is expected to fall short of the government target for the fourth straight year in 2015, which could limit government spending on key areas. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. President Park geun hyes picked to become the next Prime Minister of Korea has expressed his regret about a number of allegations swirling around him and his family's past. On the first day of his confirmation hearing on Tuesday, Lee Wang Gu was forced to defend himself against allegations that he uses his weighty power to pressure reporters and news organizations. Park Ji Won reports. The two-day confirmation hearing for Prime Minister nominee Yuan Gu got underway at the National Assembly on Tuesday. Lee, the ruling Senate Party floor leader up until late last month, began by expressing his regret over a series of allegations against him that have piled up in recent weeks. As I was preparing for this confirmation hearing, I was once again reminded of how small and problematic I was. I bitterly regret my deficiencies. The 65-year-old three-term lawmaker is facing a tough road ahead amid various allegations surrounding his past. These range from accusations of real estate speculation to doubts about whether he and his son properly fulfilled their mandatory military service. However, questions about his attempts to wield his influence over reporters was one of the main issues of contention between the rival parties. The debate grew so intense that the hearing was suspended temporarily. Lee emphasized that comments he made regarding his ability to pull strings at some news outlets were said during a private lunch with a few journalists. Lawmakers from the main opposition party called for the recording of his remarks to be played at the hearing, but the ruling Senate party objected to the idea. 
We refuse to allow the recording which was illegally acquired. If opposition party lawmakers go against our objections and attempt to play the tape, they'll be going against the spirit of compromise. We just want to know whether his remarks are something that could have been made casually at a private gathering or whether it was an indirect, implicit threat against the media. Opposition party lawmakers release a recording to reporters at the assembly, but they vow to continue with the hearing process. Lee's hearing is scheduled to end Wednesday, and lawmakers will vote Thursday. President Park Geun-hye's attempt to replace incumbent Prime Minister Jung Hong-won has so far failed, with two previous nominees both withdrawing from consideration for the post. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. The newly elected chairman of Korea's main opposition party has been riding a swell of public support since assuming his new position earlier this week. His supporters say Moon Jae-in has adapted his political ideals to appeal to a greater portion of the general public, but his opponents say it's just a carefully crafted ploy to set himself up for another shot at the presidency in 2017. Gon Soa reports. He lost the 2012 presidential election. But Moon Jae-in has bounced back into a position of power as the main opposition party's new leader. And his popularity is growing strong. In fact, a recent public opinion poll by Realmeter showed more than 22 percent of people see Moon as a potential presidential candidate for 2017. He now has more support than UN Secretary General Ban Ki Moon, who's been eyed as a favorite for months. The poster says Moon's unprecedented visit to the graves of former presidents Lee Seung Man and Park Jong Hee the day after his election was viewed in a positive light by supporters of both the ruling and main opposition parties. Moon said he paid respects to the right wing leaders to realize national unity. Watchers say Moon has adapted his political views since his defeat to President Park. But critics say his change of face is a mere tactic to garner more supporters and that he needs to do more. President Park Geun-hye stole the spotlight back in 2012 with her welfare and economy pledges. Moon has changed quite a bit seemingly in preparation for the 2017 presidential election. But to show his sincerity, he needs to come with different policies. Analysts add that while welfare is the current subject of discussion in Korea, Moon should lean towards other policy changes, such as inter-Korean issues, but with a more conservative approach. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. The U.S. ambassador to South Korea says North Korea should not be demanding preconditions from Seoul in return for inter-Korean talks. Meeting with South Korean lawmakers at the National Assembly's Special Committee on Inter-Korean Relations and Cooperation on Tuesday, Mark Lippert used the example of Pyongyang asking for supplies and aid from the South in the past in return for them coming uh, back to the dialogue table. Lippert added that the Obama administration is trying to resolve North Korea issues with its close ally, South Korea, and stressed that Washington cannot accept a nuclear North Korea. The U.S. Deputy Secretary of State, currently on a tour of Asia, has stressed that Washington would not stand in the way of a possible meeting of the leaders of both Koreas in Russia this spring. Tony Blinken also says inter-Korean talks may be the key to denuclearizing North Korea. Jim Young Gil has more. U.S. Deputy Secretary of State Tony Blinken said the U.S. strongly supports President Park Geun-hye's efforts to hold inter-Korean talks as they could help pave the way for Pyongyang to drop its nuclear ambitions. However, he believes Pyongyang is not showing sincerity towards positive engagement or denuclearization. And whether President Park meets with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un at a war anniversary ceremony in Russia is solely her decision. Blinken's trip to Seoul comes amid lingering concerns that Washington's tougher stance on North Korea may hamper Seoul's bid for dialogue. U.S. slapped fresh sanctions on North Korea last month following its alleged cyber attack on Sony Pictures. Before departing for China, the top American official stressed the role of Beijing and its exceptional leverage over Pyongyang. 
He said the biggest instability in the region was Pyongyang's nuclear pursuit and that China could persuade Pyongyang to resume credible disarmament talks, given its long-standing ties. At his last stop in Tokyo, the high-ranking U.S. official is expected to discuss regional issues such as Japan's wartime sexual enslavement of Korean women. Seoul continues to demand a sincere apology from Tokyo over the matter as a catalyst to break the current icy relations between the neighboring countries. Kim young Arirang News. The United States has confirmed an American female aid worker held hostage by the Islamic State militant group in Syria is dead. Islamic State had said last Friday that 26-year-old Kayla Muller was killed in the IS stronghold of Raqqa in a Jordanian airstrike, but they didn't offer any proof to back it up at that time. However, U.S. authorities say Ms. Muller's family received a private message from IS with what they said was, quote, additional information which confirmed that she had been killed. Her parents also released a letter. We just saw then that uh, their daughter had written to them while she was being held. Now, this development comes as multiple sources say the White House will send Congress an authorization for the use of military force to fight IS on Wednesday. The president is expected to ask for a three-year authorization. It will also leave open the option to sending ground troops if needed. Two of the world's biggest tech giants have reached a settlement over their long-drawn-out legal battle. In a joint statement, Samsung Electronics and Microsoft announced the end to a contract dispute in a U.S. court as well as at the International Chamber of Commerce. Microsoft filed a lawsuit against Samsung last year over unpaid royalty fees related to software patents used in smartphones. The terms of the final settlement were not released. China's steady stream of steel shipments has led to a supply glut in global markets and with Chinese steel exports hitting new highs in uh, January. For Korean steelmakers, it seems things are going to go and get a lot worse before they're going to get any better. Now, Kim Minji reports. Steelmakers in Korea are in for a tough year, especially with growing shipments from China in a market already suffering from an oversupply. China, the world's largest steelmaker, exported 10.3 million tons of steel products in January, up more than 50 percent from a year ago. The gain comes despite a new tax rule in China that was expected to curb the country's steel shipments this year. China ditched a tax rebate of 9 to 13 percent on steel products that contain boron, a chemical added to steel products to increase quality. Many Chinese steelmakers had taken advantage of the tax rebate system, enjoying a return equivalent to roughly 30 to 40 U.S. dollars for every ton of steel exported. But with no signs of the supply glut dwindling, analysts in Korea say the country's steelmakers have a rough year ahead of them. Chinese steelmakers have turned to other chemical products that are still subject to tax rebate. And due to China's oversupply of steel products, exports will remain robust. Falling prices will also add to Korean steelmakers' woes. Experts say Korean companies need to focus on lowering their prices in order to gain a stronger foothold in the market. Korea shipped just under 370,000 tons of steel to China last month, down more than 8 percent from a year ago. In the same period, Korea's imports of Chinese steel rose about 1 percent. Kim min Arirang News. The star anchor for NBC News in the U.S. is taking a break from broadcasting as his employer looks into some deceitful statements he made in relation to his experience reporting on the Iraq war all the way back in 2003. Brian Williams issued an on-air apology last week after claiming a number of times over the years that uh, he had been on board a military helicopter that was shot down, a claim which turned out to be completely made up. Al Connelly reports.
Good evening, I'm Lester Holt. In for Is Brian Lester Holt here. filling in for Brian Williams on NBC's Nightly News? Williams, who's been anchoring this newscast for more than 10 years now, remained off the air on Monday as controversy swirled around him. Holt addressed the issue. We want to take just a moment to tell you where Brian is tonight. In a message to his colleagues over the weekend, Brian told us he's taking several days off this broadcast amid questions over how he recalled certain stories he covered. He'll be off while this issue is dealt with. Williams took himself off the air over the weekend because of a false claim that he was on a helicopter that was hit by a grenade in Iraq back in 2003. Over the years, Williams has retold the story many times, but has now admitted the claim was false after veterans from the incident reported on social media and media outlets that Williams was not on that helicopter. I want to apologize. I said I was traveling in an aircraft that was hit by RPG fire. I was instead in a following aircraft. In the first published interview out on Monday in the U.S. military newspaper Stars and Stripes, Williams said he assumed the helicopter took damage. But despite his apology and explanation, many journalists and military personnel are calling for his resignation. NBC has launched an internal investigation into Williams, who is now also facing scrutiny over statements he made on other major news events. Connie Lee, Arirang News. Time now for a look through the global headlines we're following this Wednesday morning in Seoul. For that, we turn to Eunice Kim, standing by at the News Center. Good morning, Eunice. And good morning to you, Mark. Fighting in eastern Ukraine has kicked up as either side tries to make gains ahead of a four-way top-level peace summit slated for later today in Belarus. Pro-Russia rebels launched rocket attacks on a residential area and a key military base in Kramatorsk. Officials said at least seven civilians were killed while dozens of others were hurt. An imprint of a rocket strike was visible on the ground of Ukraine's military headquarters. This as the volunteer battalion Azov, fighting on the side of Kiev, launched an offensive against the separatists near Mariupol. Lower-level officials began arriving in the Belarusian capital of Minsk, where leaders of Ukraine, Russia, Germany and uh, France will try to bring peace to the war-torn region. They are expected to discuss a new demilitarized zone and withdrawing heavy weapons, among other topics. And from the U.S. and U.K., India to Argentina, there's a growing call to investigate charges that British bank HSBC helped more than 100,000 wealthy customers dodge taxes. Reporting by the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists said clients who held such Swiss HSBC accounts included everyone from athletes, celebrities, royalty and politicians, all of whom the bank assisted in concealing millions of dollars in assets. HSBC has admitted as such and said it was cooperating with relevant authorities. A committee in the UK says it will call in HSBC's former chief to testify in investigations, while a judge in Belgium said he was considering issuing international arrest warrants. Politicians in Switzerland are also calling for a regulatory investigation. And finally, the Islamic State group has hacked into Newsweek magazine's Twitter account and posted a threat targeting the family of U.S. President Barack Obama. Posting a banner with the words Cyber Caliphate and Je suis IS, it tweeted, Michelle Obama, we're watching you, you girls and your husband. Newsweek was able to clear up its Twitter by mid-morning, and what you're seeing there or what you were seeing there was a uh, global hacking group anonymous. It disabled the Facebook and Twitter accounts of the IS group, posting a YouTube video in which it promises to expose IS. And a good Wednesday morning to you all as we kick things off with the ongoing investigation over Pak Taiwan and his doping scandal, where the latest reports expect the Olympic swimmer to face a 20-month ban 
putting him in down for the 2016 Rio Summer Games. And according to reports coming out on Tuesday, Park Taiwan is set to leave to Switzerland on the 22nd of the month, where he is set to face a hearing with FINA at the end of the month. There, he is expected to be given a suspension of 16, 20, or 24 months with Park Taiwan most likely set to receive a 20-month suspension. While a two-year ban will prevent him from competing in the Rio Summer Games, a 20-month ban will give him three months to prepare, which won't be enough time for him to prepare and pretty much ending his career. Well, on a brighter note, this past weekend was a memorable one for super rookie Kim Se young who won her first LPGA Tour title during the Pure Soap Bahamas LPGA Classic. And after her dramatic victory, she jumped quite a bit in the latest world rankings. Of course, going to the tournament ranked 40th overall, the 22-year-old jumps up 17 spots after her win and is ranked, now ranked 23rd in the world. Of course, the win also gives her 150 points in the rookie rankings, giving her the early lead. Meanwhile, Lydia Ko, despite finishing a stroke behind Pagin B, remains the top-ranked golfer for the second straight week, with Pagin B trailing by just 0.25 points. Now, come June of, 20, uh, June of this year, the 2015 FIFA Women's World Cup will kick off in Canada, with Korea hoping to go as far as they can in the tournament. But they're also hoping for something else come next month. With FIFA set to reveal the host nation of the 2019 Women's World Cup next month in Lausanne, Switzerland, two countries are in contention. And those two countries being Korea and Switzerland. Now, having already given the rights to the U-20 World Cup, if they do win the hosting rights to the 2019 Women's World Cup, they will be automatically given the hosting rights to the U-20 uh, Women's World Cup as well, giving them three straight years of World Cup events. Now, up until recently, the most popular pirate in the nation was a pirate by the name of Luffy from the ever-so-popular comic One Piece. But now, the most popular pirate is a baseball player by the name of Kang Jong-ho. Apparently, the interest in Kang is pretty high over in the States as well as CBS Sports named the Pittsburgh Pirates as one of the winners this past offseason for signing names like A.J. Burnett, Francisco Liriano, and also Kang Jong-ho. As usual, there's still a lot of skepticism over the former Nexon hero, but they added that the risk is low for the middle infielder. Wang Kang is set to travel to Florida with his work visa being issued. Now, a few years back, the current president of FIFA, Sepp Blatter, basically ran for re-election without having any opponents. 2015 comes, and now he's going to run against three other candidates. Now, the incumbent president, Seb Blatter, who has held his position since 1998, will go up against three big names, which includes former Portuguese international Luis Figo, Michael von Prague, the chairman of the Dutch Football Association, and the current vice president of FIFA, Prince Ali bin Al Hussein. With recent allegations of corruption within FIFA, chances are Seb Blatter will be replaced by one of the three candidates come May 29th in Zurich, Switzerland. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs. Good morning. You know, I didn't have to turn on heater in my car on my way to work this morning. We are kicking off under much milder conditions. The current reading has already gone up to above the freezing mark here in the capital. And afternoon highs will also be a few notches higher than yesterday, creating a mild Wednesday. But remember how dusty it was yesterday all day long. The level of fine dust were two to three times higher than usual. And that high level of fine dust should continue today, especially to the upper parts, including here in the capital, while the rats can expect to have partly sunny skies. With that in mind, let's take a closer look at the readings for today. So the low in Seoul kicked off at minus one, then the high will climb up to six, and the top temperatures in Daegu and Gwangju will rise to 11 and nine, and Busan will peak at 12 this afternoon. And as for the other regions, uh, Jeju Island and Daejeon should see a high of 12 and nine, and Tokdo peaks at seven. But that's all for Korea, and here's international weather for beers around the world.
Uh, well, on that note, that's going to do it for now. Have a great day and stay tuned to Ali Dang TV because Korea Today is coming up in a little over half an hour's time. Goodbye.